is approve the last meeting's minutes. Anyone have a chance to look at those? Probably just was every were you guys part of that meeting? Mm -mm. No, no, you guys were. You guys just got confirmed by city council. Mm -hmm. So it was Bernie. So it was, so you probably you two, I guess, and Bernie. Did you guys have a chance to look at the okay. minutes? Were they correct? I we didn't get copy. Didn't, didn't get a copy of it this time. So you guys didn't get a copy of them, Bernie? No. Okay. They went out with the agenda. They went out with the agenda. Did we you didn't get that either. <laughs> we missed an email, I think. Okay. So I guess we can wait to approve those. Can we resend those out then, I guess? We can resend them out. Okay. So we'll do that. We'll resend out. So look in your email next month or here within shortly a few days. Minutes from last month's meeting as well as minutes from this month's meeting. And then we can move forward with those. Um, you all got them though, right? Just to make sure. Okay. 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 You might need to check your spam too. Okay. It looks like you got them. And in there, there's links to recordings, so it's not going to be in there word, word for word, but Cheryl does provide links to the recorded portion, so you can refer to those, too. Okay. okay. The state changed their requirements, so we don't have to say what Laura said and Russ said. And all that. Oh, I don't find people. <laughs> okay. Um, there he is. Here I am. <laughs> Just finished dinner. <laughs> oh, nice. Uh, the next order of business will be to elect a chair. So there's usually a chairperson. It's not typically me that runs the meetings, but we have a chairperson within the commission that runs the meetings we coordinate with and do things like that. Does we can do a, a silent um, vote, or if you guys want to nominate anyone. You want to discuss amongst we probably should do that just kind of everyone just kind of introduce themselves since this is the first meeting for you two and maybe we can just introduce ourselves and see where what our backgrounds are and why we're on the commission is the full committee now. so becky is is the sixth person she has a sinus infection tonight so and then uh, and she's probably been on the committee the longest and then bernie is the second longest Sounds like she's going to get a motor. <laughs> <laughs> you don't show up, you know. That's right. Yeah, that's kind of how it goes, right? That's right. Um, but we can just do some introductions real quick. I'm Sam Kelly, city engineer. Uh, I've been here for 20 years now this summer. Worked in all the different areas in the engineering division. Was Richard Manning before you? Uh, Richard Manning, he was, when I was here, he was the assistant city manager, and then he was the director over administrative services. He was the public works director for that's, a little while. That's what, yeah. Yeah. I don't want to find yeah. I didn't know he got moved around, but that's kind of what he was when I, when I got here. But I've worked in construction and design and private development and transportation. So, yeah, I've kind of been all through the division here. So that's me, originally from, from Montana. Um, I was in the Army Reserve for a while, uh, got my degree from Montana State, got a master's from BYU in public administration, uh, married, have four kids, uh, finally a grandpa, yeah. do have a grandkid, so yeah, That's kind fun. of, Brian, my youngest is playing baseball, so I was kind of watching to see how they were playing against Provo, and they beat them eight to zero, so oh. we're good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we're off. This is my first in-person meeting. In fact, it's only my second meeting because I was had another job that I couldn't come on Tuesdays for quite a, a little bit there. This is our first in-person meeting in two and a half years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Great. Um, lived here in Orm for 30 years, 35 years now. Married, five kids. Eight grandchildren. <laughs> They're better than our real kids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And one of them lives with us, but we didn't come to Boston. But I'm a 
accountant by trade, but I have built houses myself. I built that I built. And just be here to serve them. See if we can get better transportation around here, better traffic flow. Is what uh, my name is CJ Meekum. I grew up in Springville originally. I went to BYU. Uh, my first grown up job out of college was in Seattle. I lived there for about a year and a half. I worked for FedEx, that's what I still do. I came back here um, and very similar. I just kind of want to see if I can do anything useful and maybe making transportation a little bit better here. Maybe we'll see. <laughs> I'm Laura Redford. Um, I'm the newest resident of, of Orem. We moved here this summer will be three years. I have three kids. Uh, one's in junior high and two are in elementary school. Um, I mostly teach history um, at BYU. My field was urban history and that morphed into some history of planning. And so I taught in the geography department some of the history of planning classes, and they were super desperate. They had a, a hiring issue and asked me to teach transportation planning. So I got a real fast uh, introduction. I taught it last year, and I just came off the semester teaching. And it's just been fascinating. I've learned so much, and I loved it. And I firmly believe transportation connected to land use or the foundations of how our cities function. And, and I want to make a difference. There you go. I'm Jake Rizbila. Uh, my formal education is in uh, transportation safety engineering. I do, uh, I work as a consultant for, uh, and do uh, collision reconstruction and transportation safety engineering consulting. So I think my background is probably fairly suited for this. Um, but, uh, also looking, see if I can help out any, maybe more on a technical side, but uh, we've been here in Orm for about 15 years, a small diversion to Chicago, which we couldn't get out of there fast enough. <laughs> I swore I'd never complain about traffic again, leaving there, but uh, I found myself complaining some. So. Very good. I moved from West LA, so oh, I understand the yeah. traffic. Yeah. Yeah. from Montana, I don't understand it. <laughs> but it's no, the, the one traffic light in the town. Yeah, yeah. It's like, it was so great that they had no when they when the feds took away the, the regu to, to regulate the speed limits on the freeways, and I fifteen and I ninety went back to what it was prior to, which was reasonable and prudent. <laughs> so you didn't have speed. Even better. So I'm Cheryl Vargas. I'm just do the minutes. Kind of try to be invisible. That Sam and you guys do your your work. Um, I was born and raised in Holiday, which is up in Salt Lake area, but moved here from Simi Valley. Worked for Simi Valley. Lived in Thousand Oaks mm -hmm. about seven years ago. So I've been here that long. I don't live in Orm, but I love working in Orm. So, and Bernie, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, Bernie Turner, uh, been all over the country, <laughs> the, ended up with Orem Police Department for 25 years, retired from there, uh, worked traffic for 14 years, uh, enforcement, accident investigation, love that. Uh, it's been uh, a challenge, but... Uh, we uh, worked our way through everything, and the city's getting too big now to uh, <laughs> enjoy it as much. But uh, uh, that's where we're at at this point. <clears throat> okay. You probably know my neighbor, Phil Murphy, then, don't you? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, we do. Yeah. I've known him for about 20 years. 
Richard Manning lives next. Like I used to live across the street from him, and I was around the corner. Uh, and you might know Bob Air is also in my neighborhood. He was on the police force for a long time. But we know. Well, um, so with that being said, who would we like to have as your chairperson for the Transportation Advisory Commission? The lone soldier that didn't show up today? Who was that? Peggy? Peggy? So what are the responsibilities of the chairperson? <laughs> the chairperson would obviously, they would conduct this meeting. Um, the chairperson would also be the spokesperson if uh, like right now, currently we're looking at updating our transportation master plan, they would attend a any meetings that we would have if we took it to, I don't know if planning commission necessarily looks at the transportation master plan, but I know city council would in a work session, we would bring that forward to them, ask if they had any questions, kind of give a brief rundown so it's really not much more than this than besides a few meetings and then if there were anything that came up from the transportation commission like from the master plan there'll be some items in there some suggestions for projects speed studies traffic calming all sorts of things and they may be on occasion be asked to attend those meetings with, with me if there happened to be things that were a little bit controversial so it wouldn't be a lot in all in all seriousness. Some additional duties. Does anybody actually want it? Or yes. I probably wouldn't mind just because I'm interested in a lot of the issues. <laughs> so, we have, so Becky's off the hook and Jay wants it. Jay. Jay, how do you say your last name? It's fine as long as you don't look at it. <laughs> <laughs> so do we have a motion, I guess? Does anyone, I guess you nominate yourself? I, I just Rest nominate. Rest nominate. Yeah, I just yeah. Okay, so there we go. So he, yes, he's in. So Oh, we guys, we have to go around. Yes. Oh, we have to vote first. Let's make a decision. All in favor? Yeah. Are you in favor, of Bernie, or no? Yes. Yes. In favor. Any opposed? No. Okay, Jay. You're the chair. Okay. Um, and the next item, I was just going to go over some projects, some current updates on some of the current projects that we currently have going on. Uh, the roundabout project at 12 South and 4th West. Still, right now we're going working through the, the right of way phase. Um, we're working with the church to acquire property. I still haven't heard from their representative. I did have to do an update to the original appraisal that I did a few years ago. Property went up about thirty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. So we're just taking a small portion, and I can show you on the map yeah, here. It's going to be existing. Kind of map. I do well with maps. Yeah, twelve thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah, it's a five legged one. So I guess. We need to tell you where the roundabout is now. I think so, I have yeah. Yeah. Northwest. Yeah. Let me bring up. I guess does this time. mouth it's not connected to your no. mm -hmm. But I can give you my well, computer. Stores, if you I wonder if I should share so that we can see it on is the school having any <laughs> so you <laughs> UVU initially, so it needs to be uh, upsized and up upgraded for the current conditions. The roundabout itself, the center island is too small. It's not a large enough route radius. So in our analysis, we first it was a MAG funded project. We had applied for the funding to to update and 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 rebuild that the roundabout. With that money, we hired Horrocks Engineering. They did the analysis. A larger single lane roundabout gets us to about 2030, 2040. And then past that point, we need to look at either a dual lane or a or a hybrid type round, uh, roundabout. And what they recommended is was a hybrid where we have two lanes through portions of it. Some of the approach lanes are single lanes. Mm -hmm. uh, 
we took that concept to, and that was one of the items that I brought to the commission saying, you know, we can do this in one of two ways. We can phase it, being that we, um, um, lost it on the computer. It's just not up there. What did we do? Did we lose Bernie? Did you pulled out a cord. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw a cord fall. You've seen that before. Bernie, are you lost. still there? Yes. Okay. So we brought more oxygen and they explained the okay. whole methodology where we could either A, um, something like this. Yes, we touch it. I'll just Let's see if I can get to it here. Build it some more. where we made one large, where we built the, the single lane first or do we move forward and just build the, the hybrid one right, right now? And, it, and after the discussion, just because roundabouts are a little harder to build because you have to shut down all four legs typically to build it, we went ahead and moved forward with that. So right now we're looking to build, it's gonna take, we bought this home. So a portion of this property will be used for the, the roundabout. We're working with UVU. They're all on this side, and then the church is on this side. The church effectively will lose this access point as well as a few parking stalls. And then, so we're working with them to purchase that property. UVU is going to deed us the property. They were a little concerned at first. They, they thought it was too too large. They thought, why are we doing that? We don't need that. And it's, it's an interesting um, situation with UVU because I don't know why they feel like they don't, they generate enough traffic. They're a huge traffic generator for for this community. So they were a little apprehensive. We had to go meet with them with Horox, and they realized that we need to do the the hybrid roundabout. So that's where we're at right now. We're going through the process to purchase this property. There's also other lines that actually intersect right here at the intersection, north, south, and east, west. And we're working with uh, Rocky Mountain Power for that design. On MAG-funded projects, we can't, I don't know if it's state law, but we're not, we don't have our franchise rights. If it's a city project, city funded, the city can exercise the, our franchise rights and then all of the private utility companies would relocate their utility at their own expense. But because we're receiving federal, state, county dollars for this, now it's a 50-50 split. So they're gonna be looking to redesign that and we'll have to figure out what that is and incorporate it in, into the overall cost, uh, cost of, of the project. Um, likely, the, we're anticipating construction for next year of 2023. I will likely have to go to MAG and ask for a, a tip, which is transportation improvement project modification to get more money because we didn't in, in, you know, include a 8 to 10% inflation rate when it was actually time to, to build the project. So that's the one project that we have actively going with MAG. Sam, what is the building that's there, not the church or UVU? This guy? Yeah. That is Hobby Lobby. Okay. So with, we're not going to impact anything on this project on this side. When, when UVX came, came through, uh, UTA already negotiated with the Boyer Group this sliver of, of property. So we'll just be modifying that. Um, also with that, is the, sorry, is the church used for Institute or anything like that? No, I'm just it's, trying to think how people would be trying to cross that. It's street. just a meeting house. Just they're talking. Um, the other thing too, is we are going to get some money from UTA. Initially they were just going to, with this project, just modify this corner. They felt like the roundabout was big enough for their buses and it really never was. And the, the, the reality was is politically, they didn't have the money to put at doing the roundabout. They didn't have it in their initial scope. So when that project came through, there were some things that we missed. And one of them was this roundabout. The other one was 12 South. 12 South needs a thicker pavement section and they are going to give us the money that it would cost to create that by two inch, to, to increase that thickness to five inches right now there's only three so they are going to be giving us some money to do portions of these projects too but once i have the, the right of way all figured out it's purchased it's in our name then we'll move forward with 
selecting a, a contractor, I'll invoice UTA for those funds and we'll have them on the the project. Congested there a lot? Because I go through there like four, five, six, seven times a week. Not doesn't seem congested at all. It's just like right. but I, I don't know the time. I mean I'm not there yeah. in the mornings or it's not so much that it's congested. I think there is, when, when we look further out to more of a build out scenario, that it's going to have some problems and create delay. But the biggest problem we have right now is this leg of, of the intersection, you can have travel speeds of up to 50 miles an hour. It's, and it's not safe. I mean, that that, that would be- yeah, Having that right right car right next to that exit. <laughs> so typically when you enter a route, a, a route it could be anywhere, Probably the mid twenties is what the speed should be, because that way they're slower down. Everyone should be entering it at a, at a similar speed, because you have enough geometry in there to, to create the deflection to offset things and cars slow down. This one we built that with the amount of space we had. It's a substandard design, and it's not safe. So that's one of the reasons why we need to make it bigger. And there was thought of, well, we could just eliminate it and make it a, a, a signal because a signal is actually going get, to get us better level of service in the long run. But the problem is, is that it's five legs. And if we were to do a signal with four, we would have to eliminate that, or probably bring it there, or just put a, a cul-de-sac, and that's not what UVU desires. They want that direct connection. Not only UVU, but this whole neighborhood, if we took that away, that means they would travel down fourth west and come down on 980. And that that would be a nightmare. So that's where we're at with the roundabout project. Where where did you go? Sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna ask, do you have like a rendering of what the final project would look like? I do, but I don't know if you have it. Mm -mm. Is it the, I had it for the last the one. In there, the bigger circle oh, no, that's actually just the these lines in here are actually our center line. Um, GIS data, so if you click on it, it tells you when it was overlaid, things like that. I apologize. I think I had it on my computer, but I don't know if you have I didn't get your presentation. Ex access to it, because I had it from last time. So the design has already been set, and it would just be contracting with someone. To so what we it. have right now is we have the horizontal design, and now we're making sure that we get all the right away, and yeah. then they'll do the vertical as far as all the drainage and things like that. And then we'll have a complete design package. Once that's in place and we have all the right of way procured, then we would go ahead and advertise for a contractor to build it with the thought that we wouldn't build it until um, UVU is out of session. So mid mid May, I don't know whenever their last day of school is. How are you going to increase the cement two inches? You have to tear the whole thing out. So when we have to to reconstruct twelve south, yeah, we would have to mill out <laughs> all of the asphalt because. You can't just mill down two inches and add add to it. Right. And most of our our, our projects yeah, we'll we be there. Oops, sorry. Okay. There I am. <coughs> but um, but usually on our on our overlays on our typical ones. Oh, there it is. Perfect. What we do is we do an edge mill and then overlay. So the edge is kind of milled down so that the asphalt edge is the same height as 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 the curb and gutter, and then we add the rest of it. To the roadway but on 12 south where we're having to add an additional two inches we can't do it that way we're gonna have to mill off Go all of the inches. asphalt yeah. and then reshape the base and pave it all in a couple different lifts but that's what the the hybrid roundabout looks like how far down 12th west but if it's all the way down into 12 south i mean 12 south yeah no we're just going right here just prior to just that, that entrance to. into uvu into that do we have crosswalks yeah, so yeah, right. for roundabouts, the crosswalks are pulled Should back. Pulled back, yeah. And they're right there, and right there, there, there. And, and with there. those, it looks like double segments. So is there a little pedestrian island here? In there? Yeah, the, yeah. You're so going to have a island. small little refuge yeah, area. Yeah, refuge right there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. There any kind of like signaling system that pedestrians will use to watch traffic on the road? Yeah, there's yeah, that we we haven't we haven't planned on putting like an RRFD or anything like that in there. Is that what you mean? Yeah, we haven't. There hasn't been that. We haven't the huge pedestrian need here to actually look at doing something like that. If there was, we possibly could look at doing something like that. But we haven't. And for us, we're yeah, we're fairly 
reactive and complaint based. And if there were some injuries there or complaints, hey, I'm not being seen or whatnot. I just, for me personally, a roundabout is great for, for vehicles. It's not really good for peds and bikes. But this is more auto centric. We have a lot of cars running through here. And that's kind of where we're treating it. Do you anticipate there'll be a lot more traffic once the new roundabout is completed, or do you think it'll stay about the same? Uh, yeah, I would imagine it'll probably increase a little bit if I had to guess. The other thing is, is you have this whole edge of, of UVU is, is, is redeveloping. They're starting to put in different, I, th I want to say, I think the engineering building, they're going to redo it up in this area and they have other growth um, that's going to be happening. So I would, and I don't know for sure how they're doing. I don't know if they're looking at UVX and commuter rail and the ped bridge to kind of offset a lot of that if they're taking the approach that um, University of, of Utah did where they started to get people using transit, other modes of transportation behind vehicles and then they could get rid of parking lots mm -hmm. or if these guys will end up putting in a large structure. Um, I know they have plans to expand to Vineyard as well as down to Payson, but those master plans seem to be pretty fluid. We were just kind of, I mean, with COVID and online, I think that kind of changed a lot of things. And their plans, I think, have changed quite a bit. But that's what we have kind of scheduled for this trip right now. Yeah. And not to, obviously, if if UVU, or not necessarily UVU directly, but if they decide to do more student housing projects in the in the local area, in that, you know, close close proximity where they, developers purchase a neighborhood, and then they build the unit drop in 1200 units like they did just north of here that's what we need for traffic yeah i mean the reality is is that it's really reduced the amount of trips in an area mm -hmm. for the off during the peak because you have students there that no longer need to commute to the area they're there and they're walking now there might be in increased trips in, in the evening or during the off peak when they're not in school but i don't think they've seen the uptick in traffic like they thought they would at least if they did, they're not complaining about it because when that came in, it was the world was going to end. The, the apocalypse was upon us, and I just haven't heard anything. So so I could be wrong. Well, one of the best ways to deal with traffic is to put people and the things that they're going to closer together. Right. right. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree. So what giant statue are we going to put in the middle of that? <laughs> Keep up with the rest of the cities. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, the whale's taken and the, the yeah. dragon's done. So yeah. we got to come up with something else. This, this will likely be that the middle of that will be landscaped with, with UVU. Like, right, right. The, the current thing we have right now is, is, is UVU takes there care of that. Is that takes care of that, the yeah. landscaping there in the middle. So they'll be. The gateway to their. Yeah, campus. they'll be pretty yeah. interested in putting something there. So. So, Sam, is it just the church we're waiting on for their property? Because it sounds like we yeah. have rights for the other properties already. Yeah, and we've done what we can to not um, get into that property. <laughs> didn't touch this that this this lady that, that lives here, she's pretty adamant. She doesn't want to have anyone to get close to her property. So we've done what what we can to stay out of her and not di disrupt her in any way, shape, or form. UVU is just waiting for the moment when she decides to sell. So, but yeah, we've kind of pulled our design away the sidewalks and things like that we don't want to put up any walls take any any trees away from her so we're avoiding her as much as we can yeah that's, that'll be a big project it's taken a while to get to get to where we're at but we're getting there any other questions about that one okay the other one we're doing i do finally have a draft of our transportation master plan from horrocks and we're reviewing it right now um, once we give them our comments and they put those in that, then I'll release that to you guys to, for your re review as well, because that'll be something you guys will want to look at and endorse. We take it through the council and they'll approve that. Are you guys all comfortable with me putting out like in a Google Drive and sharing that? Everyone savvy enough to do that? Sure. Okay. That's what I'll, I'll do then when I get that. Right now I'm reviewing it in some software called blue beam it's in a cloud and we all get to collaborate and look at it but when i get that draft back then i can share it in the google drive and you guys can review it make comments things like that i don't see a lot in there changing other than uh 
updating from 2040 to 2050. Um, some of the existing volumes and growth seem to be a little bit off in some of the maps. And I, and I can provide the 2015 as well. And you guys can review the 2015 current uh, uh, transportation master plan if you'd like. It's on our website right now. You guys can go ahead and look at that and, and become familiar with it. But I don't see a lot of things changing in it. Um, Lakeshore Parkway is a parkway that has been, so far, we've received um the technical committee with mag has approved it so now it just has to go to the um i call it the political committee but I'm the regional planning commission the regional planning committee which is essentially your elected officials the mayors they will meet in may take what we have as as a, as a technical staff uh, move forward and they'll approve that so it should it'll be funded in 2025 2026 somewhere in there the city had asked for a total of the project is around 18 million and we asked for 17 we'll, we'll provide a 6.7 percent match and so we will this year in our current budget year and and anticipating that 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 that, that it would score well i had asked for money now to start putting it away so when it comes to 2025 i have that money available i'm not asking for a a million dollars in our budget. We're asking for two hundred fifty, two hundred seventy thousand dollars each year to get it funded, um, with the hope that with some money in place that we can start design, get some of the environmental mm -hmm. component cleared and ready to go. So when I have the funding, again we can just start construction. So oh, last, yeah. So on this map, Lakeview Parkway, and I'm glad this is only a year old, but it'll connect. Here is 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 is. Is, is Lakeview Parkway um, in Provo. They've got all of the right of way and they're going to build two lanes of it. Right now, Geneva Road widening project, which is another project that UDOT is currently doing, they're looking to widen Geneva Road from University Parkway down roughly to this area in here, which is probably, I think it's about 15 south. They're going to widen that to five lanes and then continue down the rest of Geneva Road to 1860 with uh, a three-lane cross-section. Um, so that's why we wanted to hurry up and get our project. And my ask was for the, the 18 million because with Geneva Road being five lanes, we'll want to continue the five lanes down through. And I'll let Provo worry about building the rest of their facility. Provo is going to build two of their five lanes with this. <laughs> Figure out how to do the rest of it, but we'll get all city of it. Boundary. City boundary is right here. Along I can say that's the one with the bridge. The bridge is almost done, right? Yeah. yeah. Further south. Yeah. 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 And it will line up directly with the road that comes right in front of the airport down in Provo. Yeah. And eventually, May has a vision project of crossing <laughs> Provo Bay and continuing out into Spanish. So. You guys really want some stuff. I can give you a link to Transplant 50. It shows all those big projects, too. So, yeah, that's what we have going on here. So I'll, I'll we'll start putting money away. So where does that end up connecting Geneva? Yeah, what will happen is, is we'll actually take Geneva Road and we'll swing it around so it ties in. We're trying to go around the outside of this wetland area, and it'll tie directly in. So the five-lane facility will essentially aim straight down and continue mm -hmm. down this instead of Geneva Road. We'll actually come down here. We'll intersect with 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 Lakeshore, and then we'll have you'll, you'll be able to turn left and then go down Geneva Road. That's what that will be. So it, it'll eventually be an alternative to the freeway to getting to Provo Airport. Yeah, yeah, it connects with uh, Parkway yeah. or uh, Avenue. Yeah, it'll actually just when it goes all the way down around. Down. Yeah. Well, Regent just announced a hundred new flights. Well, Provo, Provo, the last funding cycle, which was so for Mag, you, you go to Mag every two years for funding, and Provo's big ask at that time was twenty million dollars, and that all went to the airport, and they're going to end up with four terminals there, so you'll have more than just Allegiant there, unless Allegiant decides to take all four, and it's a kind of a hub. But the whole purpose was is to get other carriers in there, be a little more competitive, and it's more of a regional airport. So yeah. with that happening, this roadway has the potential to be pretty busy. 
And it's probably as far as long as I've been been here, this is the most regionally significant project we've ever done. Most of them service specifically Orem, but this one really isn't going to serve Orem as much as it's going to serve this whole county. And so pretty exciting, but uh, yeah, it's a lot of money to go to. Um, speaking about the uh, budget uh, this year, I also had asked for um, 200,000. Well, initially it was 100,000, but they decided to go with $200,000 on an annual basis. And I'll be able to use that money to fulfill the projects we have in our transportation master plan. Right now in the, in the master plan, there's a bunch of projects that are identified, but we don't necessarily have a funding source. Most of our transportation projects are funded either through MAG, if they're very large, or if they're smaller, it's through the general fund. Other capital projects, water, sewer, stormwater, roadway, they're all sort of enterprise funded. Your water fees, your sewer fees, your stormwater fees, those monies go to fund those types of projects. The transportation ones, the roadway, it's typically funded through our BNC road funds, which is what you pay for at the sales at the gas pump. And then you have some sales tax money too that the county's collected and they've allocated that for transportation. And so that's how our transportation projects are typically funded. What is MAG standing for? MAG is the Mountain Land Association of Governments. They're a metropolitan planning yeah. organization. I didn't know they got into transportation. Yeah, and they, they are the keeper of millions of dollars of federal money. Of and then we all, as, as, as a county, we all submit projects and we compete for that money. I think this year there's around 90 million, 80 million dollars that they figured that they would have by that funding cycle. So all the communities come together with projects and figure out how, and then we vote on them, whether they're regionally significant. What do they do is, is one phase two trails. It's kind of, it's, it's an interesting process because I, I don't like it that way. I would rather, everyone should get a piece of that pie based on your sales tax that you make for the whole county. So if there's, a, I've tried to talk to them and to say, hey, if it's 80 million, why don't we take 30 or 40 and just divvy it up to all the communities based on how much sales tax is generated in each city, and then they can do transportation projects because the reality is, is we're all connected. So anytime I'm putting a signal in or I'm doing anything, it's gonna impact not just my little area, but it's going to be other communities too. And some of these projects, it's just small communities don't have a funding source. They don't have enough center line road miles for BNC road, road funds, or they don't generate enough tax off the sales tax to really do much. So they're asking for a signalized intersection improvement, which for us, we're lucky enough that in a few years we could fund an intersection, a, a new signal. And some communities can't, they just don't make the money. So I can propose, hey, doesn't every shouldn't everyone just get a cut of the pie? And then it's big projects. Let those big projects kind of go ahead and and, and settle in and, and we figure out those, but let everyone get a little bit of money to improve their transportation. But they didn't want to do it that way. They, these planners want to do it different. So so, anyways. But it's a good process, but it just it's a it's a long process. It's about six months worth of putting together your idea phase. And then if that gets um, positive recommendations and you go to a concept phase, and if that seems to score well, then we take a bus ride all day and drive all the projects and then come back and we vote on them. And there's some, and there's some politicking that happens, you know, Orem and Provo, we seem to have targets on our back because we're the communities that have been here the longest. We generate the most sales tax. We have, bigger needs and some of these smaller communities don't so they get tired of us consuming all the money so we learn to kind of play nice and give them some money too and support and whatnot so um other than that um we are in the process of working with um mag and the county on 16th north and fourth east there's a roundabout that we had as a project um, that we got funded through MAG, but um, I don't think that's the right solution for that intersection where Burnock Canal crosses. And we are going to take some of that money that we had awarded for that project. I think we have a total of about 1.5 million to put a roundabout in there. Um, we're going to hire a consultant and reevaluate it and see if there's another improvement, some sort of 
obviously less expensive. Uh, roundabouts don't, in my mind, aren't very good for an mm -hmm. intersection that has more cycling and, and active transportation. And granted, it's slower speeds, but I'd rather get hit by a car that isn't moving versus 20 miles an hour. So we're going to look at some other improvements, like maybe a scramble type crosswalk where all four legs go to a stop condition and they cross at an angle. Um, it's not an intersection there. That's just for the, the, the path. Yeah, so There's what it is, high, is we have... Two of those high school is right off. Yeah, yeah, but really right now what we have is a lot of issues with compliance um, for both PEDS and... Is it just an RFP right there now? No, it's just a regular signal right now. It's, just a, signal? it's just a traffic okay. signal. But because we don't have a huge <laughs> traffic demand and because there's... There's, a really large there's enough gaps... And, and there's enough cyclists, cyclists or peds that get there yeah. and they just jaywalk or they just cross it Ill illegally. So we're trying to do what we can to have better compliance. We did have a, I think there was a small child that was hit there not, not too long ago. He's the second grade semester. Yeah. So, I mean, I, and we couldn't do much about that because as soon as it turned to walk, he shot out. So, and I was talking to a lady last night about it and I, she would like to see if her son could do some sort of a service project i said you know it would be nice to have i don't know what the education level is on educating kids when they're at intersections to stop and look even though it's green even though you see the walk guy up there are you stopping and looking prior to just going that way you get it all the time yeah so I, I said to me if your son could do that put together something and do that in in school they might do it in the beginning of the year but that's something that seems to be missing so yeah, there's so at the intersection. It is. Yeah, it crosses right there. So we're looking to do something there. On that field right there is Temple Nevis High School. Yeah. Um, well, actually, it's, it's going to be Holmes. Yeah. It just got a. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's got a. It's what is it? Twenty-two. Twenty-two nice. single-family homes, lots down there. So. Excuse me. This is Kathy Turner, Bernie's wife. Huh. This is Kathy Turner, Bernie's wife. I'm here with Bernie. Uh huh. I would love to work on that project. I walk that intersection every day. I've been nearly hit twice, so I know where the trouble spots are. And I've got some ideas of what you could do that probably wouldn't be too expensive. You know, some signage hanging near the light, uh, signs as you approach. Uh, making a you know, caution, trail crossing. I think just a few things to alert. Most of the drivers there drive it every day. There are service vehicles and things like that that come up not every day. But your north-south turners are your problem. <laughs> you know, the ones coming south, turning east, the ones going north, turning west. That's where you get hit most of the time. And I just, I think we could do some signs that would help until we could, you know, make whatever big project. So I'd be happy to help on that and give some ideas. Perfect. When we get something, we'll, we'll bring it. I think there's enough interest here at the commission as we get closer to having options and solutions i'll i'll bring those to the commission to look at and, and get your opinions on that because I, I know there's a lot of people in the community that have um they're, they're passionate about this and they, and they want to make it safe all right right is it, is it turning vehicles that are almost hitting you or oh yes <laughs> it, it's the mothers on their phones or the mothers yelling at their children going south and turning east so those are the ones that I have to avoid. I don't go across the intersection on the east side because that's where I've been nearly hit. I go on the west side and you can usually get the eye of the guys going north. But kids don't know that you have to look at the driver in the eye before you step out. Right, exactly. Yeah. So I always make them wave at me before I step out. And they do. They're really good about that, but children don't know that. And high schoolers are in a hurry. You know, they're late for school. Oh, but it's the mothers on their phones. 
the high school kids already know it. You can't tell them anything. There, yeah, when I've watched, the high school kids are pretty good. Uh, but the drivers, it's the drivers, and they're just distracted. Yeah. I like the idea of getting more ideas than a roundabout. The, um, just as somebody who has used this a fair bit, um, as I was just saying to Jay, Jay, there's no other place that I can think of in close proximity along the North Carolina trip that requires two crossings. Everything else when it's street grade is just one. It's perpendicular. Yeah. And so I would lean in favor of something like a scatter crosswalk that allows you just to cross, mm -hmm. right, where all pedestrians can move at all times if they're doing one leg or if they're going diagonal or, or however. <laughs> so it's not. It, the problem, I think, is the two-way crossing, because the other streets that that Murdoch now crosses, um, some of them are also, I I would assume, have similar levels of traffic. Maybe not quite as heavy as 1600 North, but it's the double crossing that has made it problematic. Yeah, I think it's the turning mo movements that make it more complex. It's one thing you got to worry about opposing traffic right but all of a sudden you add the right turn and the left turn in there that's where it gets a little complex i think that's where i know further west on main street there was a driver <laughs> north i think turning left going north to west and a, and a boy ran out across and i don't know if it was because i've often thought about if there's driver frustration if we have too much consideration for a through movement and then the side streets come in and you don't give them enough green time if people are familiar with that they know oh crap this is a short light i gotta accelerate yeah. and you're too worried about getting through there and we're giving too much consideration for people having to wait a little bit on, on the on the on the opposing legs where where you have your, your major movement and that's where i guess i would even pick jay's brain about that it's like what what do we find and what can we do about that because i know in peak hours, you want to move traffic, right? But if it's off peak, are we creating problems by keeping that that corridor in coordination? Should we really pull it out and change our detection to where we're not having to wait for an 80 second cycle before you can cross the street? Because if you know you got to wait, then you know you can go right, do a U turn, and do another right, and that signal still has a trip. I think we have a problem. How much of uh... Pedestrian and bicycle traffic is there at a particular intersection. Oh, wow. I don't know the counts specifically, but there are quite a few. And and I have I do have counts both from Meg, from Shauna, your sister in law, and Jim Price. I mean, they have that data for me. So yeah, it's I, constant, I, pretty much. What about short term putting those pedestrian flags? We I know there are flags are now. now. They're there. They are. Oh, I think it helps with visibility. Mm -hmm. but it's kind of a band-aid solution right now. It's working. I mean, we're surprised they haven't been stolen, quite honestly, because that's our fear is like, we're going to put them out there and then we're going to have to put out more within a month or two. And make good boat flags. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I guess we did in the winter, so no one's out on their boat yet. But I've not seen anyone use them. Really? They just yeah. Out. There are a couple of them that are torn. Who replaces those flags? Uh, our public works uh, group would so I can let Taylor know. Yeah, I know there. There's especially one that goes uh, from the south or north and south on the west side. Those flags are looking pretty rough. Okay. So they may want to check those. Having them is better than not having them mm -hmm. at this point. But also, oh, yeah. if you're cycling. The idea of picking up a flag while you're on your bike crossing is. No, I've never seen a bicycle. They're not used to it. Yeah, and, and the and, cyclists are the ones that are going faster than the pedestrians. Yeah. They're the ones that run the red light. <laughs> yeah, and I, I know Taylor has looked at trying to put some detection further upstream, downstream. If you're riding a, a, a bike, it <laughs> trips it, gets it, so we have better compliance. But I don't know where he's at. I don't think there's anything that's super reliable. Yeah. That's the hard part is trying to get something that's going to be reliable. Because... So it's kind of where we're at with this intersection. Well, I look forward to hearing <laughs> more ideas because it does need help. Yeah, it definitely does. Well, uh, if we could consider signs hanging next to the light from the crossbar 
that just say caution trail crossing or caution Murdoch trail crossing kind of gets in your head. Oh, I've got a lot of people going across here. As a driver, that would catch my attention. And I don't know if it would help, but probably wouldn't hurt. Yeah, and I know we've talked about um, blank out signs, and maybe it's a combination of a static sign or an activated sign that when the button's pushed, no right turn, people, it's, it is illuminated. It's at a level that they can see it. And, and maybe we do something with the lefts. I don't know if the lefts. It's the lefts you get right. to. The right hand turn people are pretty good. It's those left turn people who get you. It's those lefties. Uh huh. It's those lefties. The north and south <laughs> lefties. If they're going east and west, they're a little more observant. The north and south are the mothers <laughs> with a car full of kids and they're late to school. Or, you know, people going to work. And those are the ones that'll really get you. Maybe we just need to change it. Just make it, make it protective. Yeah. If it's activated. You just got to make sure you get it through, like you said earlier. <laughs> yeah. Just a pretty narrow. I think. Yes. Yeah, that yeah. protected it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, we don't give them the flashing yellow. We just give them the it just Or if it is flashing yellow, that's fine. Because we've talked about that. Even... Not just there, but globally, because if someone's, if you're walking here on State Street or you're on Center Street, if you got a, a pedestrian crossing, if I see the flashing yellow, I'm looking ahead at a car, not seeing that there's Somebody a walk, mm -hmm. it should be red until you give them that amount of time, if you got a long enough cycle time, and then it can switch down and then can let them go, or however it works, if that's the capability of the hardware. If it can be pro programmed to do that, so can we have the pedestrian button is pushed? Well, if, if the head no. button is pushed, and it, it, at least like if you had a long enough cycle time to where if I am going to turn left, it's going to give me the red arrow. But if can it hold it for say it holds it for twenty seconds, knowing the head is crossed, and then I can flip down to, or do I have to reset everything and then redo it? Yeah, it's been programmed for lead time though. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, you'd have to hold it as red, because right now it seems like as soon as it goes green, you get the yellow flashing, right? You go to green and then the yellow flashing, and then. But if you want, but if you have a ped that pushes the button and wants to cross, the through movement goes green. The turn stays red, allows them to cross. But what I'm saying is, if you if you have that, the desire, then can screen. you all of a sudden then yeah, once assuming the peds cross, then do you release the left turns or do they have to wait? Because if you have an area with a lot of, of, of pedestrians like here, that left turn could stack up for mm -hmm. a while. Or they push it, you just got to hold them, and they go every other, which then comes into our compliance of, I got a gap, I'm just going to run. What if, if you did a gap the crosswalk, then yeah. you don't have to deal with pedestrians and left turns. Because no, because you hold everything. everything else is held. Everyone's right? on red. Yeah. They cross, and then the only thing Taylor was worried about is if you have, in that scenario, you have the cyclist who just gets into it just as it turns green for whatever, or if you have a ped that happens to get across or you get someone stuck in the middle, maybe they trip or fall, and then all of a sudden you got to have some sort of a, of a detection to see that, hold it, and let it get through, and then release it. Don't you just have a longer crossing time because you're not... Well, yeah, but if you get someone stuck in the middle, yeah. and if you yeah. give them 30 seconds and they're stuck, then all of a sudden you release you it. Release now you got cars. one of them coming, and there's someone still in the middle. Yeah. Most people should see them and stop, right? Yeah. But you got to try to. You can't, you can't make. Um, well, but like on the for state every, route. Everything that could happen. Right. Like, But for so, vehicles on a state route, they have a. Dilemma zone, and if you're if you're approaching an intersection and it goes you know goes green, yellow, red, and if if you're in that zone and you're traveling at a speed, hopefully you've noticed it'll hold that yellow longer to let you get through before it just goes red and all of a sudden, yeah, because you're going too fast. To I guess you could safely. you could stop, but you're everything in the back seat's going to be in the front seat. So I think he's just looking at the what if scenarios. The first time I encountered a scattered crosswalk. I was 
as a pedestrian, I was frustrated because I didn't know what was happening. Um, I was like, why is this taking so long? There are clearly lots of people ready to cross the street. And then when it happened, and I kind of observed it for a second, I'm like, oh, we can all, go, I can, there's a line diagonally. I can go this way. And it just, there was a much longer crossing time because they, I would, I, I'm guessing would have aggregated the other, what it would have taken for, yeah. to do two different directions, right? And as a driver in that same space, um, coming to the realization that I couldn't make a right turn on a red light, um, it was just, it was just signage and education. Right. I think the one thing we, I guess, if a scramble is the solution that kind of shakes out, part of it is too is. Obviously, I think with the scramble you stop, you're probably going to get pretty good compliance with the pedestrians, maybe most runners, but a cyclist who's traveling faster, because mm -hmm. we don't have enough vehicle traffic there, there's good gaps, they'll still won't be compliant. And that's kind of a concern, too, because yeah. we're wanting to increase the compliance. And if they're crossing through a red light, they're going to be more, hopefully, more alert and looking for people right. to not run into. Right, right. But I guess we don't want to keep encouraging bad bad behavior too yeah. so i don't it's know a big glove that's yeah. <laughs> maybe this is a stupid question to ask anyway is it possible to like reroute or otherwise modify the trail itself or is that particularly expensive no we have looked at that actually um taylor and i were, were looking at that um no it's not a bad question at all we looked at possibly routing this down maybe doing it to here putting it up like a hawk type crossing and then we would just have to do some improvements along 16th to widen that to get that 10 10 foot trail and bring up there and then you're crossing there perpendicular and you're crossing here and that's an option too understanding that we would have to work with um gosh i can't remember his name that owns that field right yeah now. you still have two crossings with the one mid block yeah you're just you're separating it and hopefully you're increasing compliance but you go but yeah. mid block crossings aren't aren't what you want either and you talk about ground so initially there were thoughts and discussions about putting a tunnel there but i think because of mm -hmm. the there with you have a sewer main and water main um, in those depths, and not right. just that, plus the angle, yeah. you would have had to have come back quite quite a ways to get down below, and then with the angle point, it's not exactly a safe thing, and all of a sudden, you, people can't pull up and look down and see if anything's going on. There were some safety concerns and cost, and it just wasn't feasible. Because that was all, those types of things were all decided. I wasn't in my position now. I was a design engineer working on other projects, so I wasn't privy to everything and why they didn't. I'm sure it came down to money. They always end up with this big pot of money and they never account for some of these other things. And well, they have the tunnel that goes under um, 8th East. East. But that's a very straight spot. Mm -hmm. There's no mm -hmm. curvature. Yeah. Anywhere. And you had plenty of space on each side to come down and come up to. So. But yeah, we have looked at doing the UCJ. Yeah. I, I would say it's better than last ones, but only improved <laughs> crossing situation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'm for getting information back on other possibilities besides the roundabout for that spot. So right now, um, we work with the county. They, the county is the money that's funding this. We had an agreement, I believe, that went to the county commission mid last month, and I, I just haven't seen that agreement back yet. We'll execute it, and then Mag uh, wanted to be the lead on this. They wanted to contact, and they're very involved with the trail and whatnot. So I would imagine we get the agreement signed, then they'll solicit um, or direct select a consultant, and we'll start moving forward. I'm thinking a couple of months we should at least have. Uh, consultants selected and data collected, and I would think by midsummer maybe some concepts to evaluate and, and then go go from there. It's it's really a unique intersection. There's nothing like it in the state, 
Um, so hopefully we get someone who's got some outside of Utah exposure to kind of give us some some guidance. Does UTA weigh in as well because it's a bus route? Or does no, we don't talk much mm -hmm. about but um, earlier you said though roundabouts are pedestrian unfriendly. Why would you want to put one here where it's more pedestrian? Yeah, that's, that's why, why I want to redo it. Yeah, roundabout there would be a disaster. Yeah. Get new ideas for what to do. With right, that. but even thinking of a roundabout seems like it would be out of the question. Because so it what is less safe for the pedestrian. Yeah, what had happened is the is we had hired a, a consulting firm to look at the intersection for them. They felt like the best solution here was a roundabout because at least it slowed the other step. And I and I've had this conversation with Shauna. It was people. That's CJ's sister-in-law. And she's like, Well, I said, I get it, Shauna, but I just don't think it's the right treatment. Maybe it ends up being the, the favored one of, out of all the options. I just don't know if it was investigated enough. At the time that this was being evaluated, the current at that time, the traffic operations engineer was very adamantly opposed to a scramble, which to me seemed like more of a reasonable solution yeah, than the roundabout. But he felt like, okay, the roundabout should be fine. And I was just like, I don't like a roundabout. It's many heads. And, and cyclists too, when you come to a roundabout, either you're comfortable enough to enter the roundabout and go around, as they're called the, the spandex wearers. But if you're the recreational and you're with your family, you're not necessarily want to take all of your kids with you like you know, little ducklings through a roundabout. You kind of want to get off to the side, gather up and cross. And it's it's a little it's a little nerve nerve wracking to say the least. So I was just like, you know what, I don't want to move forward with that. I think we got other solutions we should look at besides yeah. that. So that's where we're at. I know Taylor himself has taken this signal out of coordination to try and see if we could just improve compliance by having the signal react to, to ped buttons and other things so people would kind of hold tight instead of looking for a gap and shooting across. So, but our staff is pretty lean. We're still, he needs to have another people, a few more staff members to kind of help him out with this. Cause he's, he was the, 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 the ITS engineer, which is traffic engineer over all the signal coordination and looking at timing and things like that. And that's all he did, but now he's not, he's trying to do that plus manage the sign crew and the striping crew, the street lights. So he doesn't have much of a chance to sit down and look at models, look at what's going on in the city. Cause we have a really, what we probably should do is next time maybe meet at our, our traffic operations center. Cause we have all of our signals are all mostly connected with fiber. We have cameras, you can pull them all up and look at them, and, but we just don't have the time to dedicate one person to, be constantly massaging that. So, but it's a really cool thing down there. But we're moving to get another. Oh, I think all of us should have those buttons fired. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess maybe a light for the top. Yeah. The top. I guess that that is another project. We are right now with UDOB, we're partnering with a, a connected vehicle system project. Um, UDOT is being very um, pro progressive, and we're looking at connected vehicles and autonomous vehicles. This current phase, they have a grant, and they're with. We're working with Panasonic, and what they're going to do for Orem is they're going to give us about fifty of these um, devices at our signals, and then out, outfit I think about eighty of our vehicles. Right now, we do have a preemption system. The emergency vehicles have access to it, so like your ambulance and your fire department have a preemption button where they hit a, a button in their vehicle and it emits. Uh, an, an infrared signal, and then it can change the, the timing. The problem is, is that system is very old and an, antiquated, and about 30% of it works. So this new system, we're going to be working with Panasonic. Uh, it'll be installed on our emergency vehicles as well as our snow plows. UDOT's going to have it on, on their snow plows. So if they're coming to an inter intersection, they're laying down solid or they're plowing, they'll go ahead and hold that signal so they can go ahead and get through and keep their same rate as well as on some of the major corridors like uh, Parkway and State, the UTA buses will have access to it too. Now the UTA buses will only be able to um, adjust that timing if they're behind schedule or if it's during peak or something like that. If they're within a certain window, they won't have the same latitude as our ambulance 
for our emergency responders that can go ahead and hit it, it'll hold and then go ahead and go through. Um, but I don't have access to that. I tried to talk to them that I should be able to test run it, but they won't give it to me. But even, even the fire guys, I mean, this system should be better. We had an accident one time right down south here on State Street. The fire engine was pulled in front, doing what it does is traffic control, but they had the emitter still on and it was aimed right at the signal. So State Street, so I want to say State Street was green. There was no one waiting. And I mean, Center Street was backed up. So I finally was, I looked at it and I called up dispatch. Hey, could you have the fire guys turn off their on <laughs> because we, our intersection's a mess. Oh, it is? Like, yeah, I know they're moving. <laughs> This is a disaster right now. <laughs> but the, to your point about the preemption, we are moving with the with with you dot. We'll have that in our vehicle. So yeah, it's getting better to where you're going to have connected vehicles. You're going to have real time data. Be pretty cool stuff. Awesome. Yeah. Then they'll bring in foreign cars. So yeah, they've already safe. looked at. I mean, you dot does have that on there. They have looked at drones and where a drone's going to be, and they have identified airspace and corridors and things like that. CJ? I was just thinking, um, if you're trying to like calm traffic and slow things down, what about putting like some sort of visual cues here? Like um, uh, maybe like additional trees or something on the intersections. And this just kind of crossed my mind. Like what if, see that imaginary line where the trail would be on the road? Mm -hmm. What if you were to like dig that out and put like some sort of masonry in there that kind of resemble the trail to like this visual continuation of the trail across the street. I hadn't really so thought that out, out clearly. Out from the, yeah, so it stands out from the rest of the road, this thing being distinct. Does that make any sense? No, it does. I know for the scramble, we would look to obviously strike that. Sure. And have that. We, we, I mean, the, we wouldn't really want people going from northeast to southwest, although they could. But the idea would be to. I just saying, just. I know what you're saying, just to right? put it. Yeah, you're put saying it. to have it there, period. So people. Yeah, like just, make the area visually distinct. Because yeah. if you're a driver, all you see is. I mean, if you know the trail is there, you it's there. Yeah. But if you don't, you're not necessarily going to recognize it as a trail. But if there's something that kind of catches your eye and forces you to realize there's something different about this intersection that might force people to slow down and pay more attention. That's Maybe that's idea. the treatment we do with the scramble. Yeah. Because I don't want to give the false impression, oh, there it is. I can just yeah. go across. But with the scramble, maybe it makes sense to, like like you say, we put in, uh, Springville has them where at, at their crosswalks, they just put in stamped con concrete. So when you're driving it, you feel it and you can see it because it's a different color. And maybe that's part of the treatment we put in. Be careful because there are rules. MTC outlines what we can and can't do on the roadway. So, like what 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 well, you're saying, you, they don't allow certain colors. Or, I mean, the, the point of having a crosswalk is because everybody knows what a crosswalk is, right? And so they don't allow you to deviate far. But from you can have your white lines and then have right. Your, yeah, I agree. You, you can, can do some, some, yes, you can do something. Or, that's fine. But, but we, I'm just saying. It's not a bad idea. There are no limitations. Sure. Yeah. No, it's a good point. I hadn't even thought about what's in the, the MUTCD. I guess color wise. Yeah, you're limited on color and you're limited on treatments. On treatments. Like is a stamp concrete? Uh I'd have to double check, but I I know the IT ITE stuff says probably shouldn't do. How do the tactical urbanism projects fit into that then? The... I think it's because it's temporary. Okay. Like we had one down here, there's a three legged intersection just, I guess it'd be south and west of Mountain View High School. Yeah. And we went in and put in some of, of the knockdown. Yeah. We painted like a big pink donut in the middle. Yeah. Obviously, it's temporary, understanding it, it's all water based paint and it would go away just to see what, what it would do. Um, but we've left those knockdown bollards in there and it's been operating just fine. And going back to the ask for the money with the $200,000, it would be something like that. Let's go in and finish that and make it a roundabout actually safe and per design. Because I guess if something, an accident were to happen and someone could in theory contact Jay and 
but that's why we have Monarch Commission now, so it's a conflict of interest. Are you case, yeah. Did you? Did you really? <laughs> we apologize yeah. for having you lose business. No, place. it's quite all right. I think we have a good case anyway. It's okay. <laughs> but I mean, but that's the thing is, is there, I mean, to Jay's point, we have to operate within these oh, parameters sure. to make sure yeah. that we're not. But we're not the only people that have changed the that would have done something like this. Like there are no. other examples of cities having done it. So there has to be some kind of allowance in the manual that would. Uh, it depends on the, what is it? It's shalls and shoulds when you read it. Yeah. You shall do this means you need to do yeah, it. You yeah, should, should is kind of a guide. Yeah. And you left to some engineering judgment per se. But with all that being said, you just want to make sure you limit yourself to exposure to liability. So if all else fails, even if Jade isn't on the commission, I'll always refer to Jace. Jade, can I do this, or are you going to be I'm saying, go ahead. I won't take a trip to the Nautilus. Anything else? Any other comments or general questions about what's going on in the city? No, there's plenty going on. Yeah, A lot of money going through. There's a lot of money in transportation. But we lost the we lost the five on the bolts. On the yes. Mm -hmm. Alex, yes. Drive. Right. So when people start speeding again on that road and people complain about it, what the city can do? I will just answer <laughs> the council members. <laughs> Or the people up in there who are adamantly opposed to it. I mean, I kind of, I wanted to give it some time, and then I wanted Taylor to go up and do another speed analysis to see what we had speed data, and to see what has happened in there. He went up there and finished one, and speeds as you approach those were around 25 between, at around 28 to 29 between the bumps. And it was interesting that the closer they were together, those lower those speeds were. You got a little bit more of a gap, and speeds went up. Yes. So now it's just a matter of, you know, to go up there and one, collect the data, two, and observe how many folks stay in the lane, how many folks deviate out and go around. We will go up there and strike bike lanes in still. So there will be that definition of where the travel lane is or where the bike lane is in your shoulder. But lines don't do much. Everyone drives on them or drives around them. So um, we'll just kind of see what happens. If, it, if they do complain, I don't, I mean, I, Tried to help police from having to have someone up there, not have to be there to, to get speeders, but I don't know. It's un it's unfortunate, and I know. I mean, I got I got beat up pretty hard in the in the, in the council meeting, the, the public appearances. I mean, just short of being called a chauvinist because she was a female, and I didn't return her call, even though I think Taggart did speak with her, and I, I just it was it was interesting. There's people just, I don't know. It's like they 15 feet they're for safety. But they didn't like them because they were hideous. So out they came. And even before Jay was on the commission, I asked him, did, did I do anything wrong here? Did I deviate? I thought this was pretty sound judgment. Like, no. That's exactly what we should have done. Something. Nothing wrong here. But we'll see. Signage doesn't work to slow down cars. Road design works to slow down cars. Yeah, you have to narrow it. You have to make it un, un, uncomfortable, and and the vertical deflections are what gets people's attention. That's why when you're on the freeway and they're doing crack seal, they have those little rumble strips. I mean, once you hit that, people are alert and they're looking around to see what's going on. So, well, that's all oh, it's too bad. Mm -hmm. It is too bad. I you can come put them on my question. street. What's that? You can come put them on my street. <laughs> and you live uh, eight south, just off eight south. Off eight, off eight south. Yeah, I just had someone on on eighteenth south. They want speed bumps between uh, Main Street and Sand Hill Road. That's another one. Yeah, it's a straight shot. Sixteen hundred south too is quick. Yeah, actually, we're doing a trap. We're doing. Uh, we're going out and collecting data on that because we just finished a, a uh, subdivision. So 200 East now connects into 18 South. So now you have a, a better route to get to school. 
but yeah, 16 South, they said, hey, there's a lot of potential near misses at 200 East, which is right by school. So we'll collect data there to see what we have to do. I mean, that's the, you have a collector, you don't want to really restrict traffic, but you got to get speeds down and make it safe. So I don't know what we'll do in that. Maybe we'll end up putting in a hawk signal if there's enough pedestrians that cross in there, see if the school district would participate. That's how we've funded those projects. The city pays half and then they pay half. We actually end up doing more because we design it too, but they pay half for half the cost. Yeah, if you have any hot spots that you're aware of, we definitely, and that's hopefully getting Taylor some help. We can be more proactive. That's what I want to do too, because it is, we're growing. It's you're not, and everyone wants to be here. I was just kidding with my friends. They, they go to Lake Powell and they're obviously going to have to raise the water level up, which means they either restrict the flow to the south or they have to start draining some of these. But if you're restricting flow, those people can't have water. They'll come up here where they have water. So I mean, we're creating a problem again. So uh, just general, moving back to your question, um, the master plan was a big push in the uh, mayoral election to change that, alter it, go back and look at it. Are they really doing that or? With the transportation master plan? Yeah. Um, they it's could. The state street master plan. I know the yeah, state the street state master street. plan. They actually, the state street master plan was revoked. So it, and that was just more of a zoning thing. All of the zoning went back to its original zoning, which was C2, C3, whatever it was before some PD zones. Um, but the general plan has not changed. And um, so I'm still doing the bustling. Uh, so that was part of the State Street Master Plan, was that component to it, was the, the mass transit down, down State Street. So when we get to that mass transit portion, I haven't finished my review of, of the update, but those things were, they may have been, ah, 2015 may have been prior to um, the State Street Master Plan. Wasn't that, I guess I can wasn't tell that much say responding to UTA, though? I mean, well, that's that's question. UTA how much, has a vision to go Right. Yeah, how much say does American the forum forward. get in UDOT's plans? Um, we have quite a bit. So prior to all of this, we were, we put together, they call it the, the, the Central Corridor Transit Plan. Jamie, our city manager, got together with all of the cities along State Street from here up to American Fork. He said, hey, we just went through this big planning process on UVX. And it was a pain because we really hadn't decided where we wanted transit to go. They came in and told us where it was going to go, where maybe side running would have been better. Maybe it would have been better to identify other transit stops and things like that. So let's all get together as one voice and do a study and let's decide where that's going to go now and let's with our plans of growth and development let's get that in place so that we're not having to spend money or compete for tiger money or whatever grant money let's get development as it comes through to start setting aside this right away let's look at let's jointly put this together and let's agree to where this is going to go understanding that vineyard's going to want a different need but let's at least get the backbone of where we want this to go. And then we can branch off and do other things. Eighth North might want to have it, you know, whatever. So we went through the process and, and we decided the city to go forward and, and solicit this money from MAG. Well, that's when UDOT said, hey, it's really our facility through all your communities. Let's us and UTA work together. We'll lead it because it's a roadway project, essentially. Yes, UTA is a component to it, but really it's a roadway project. So we got move, to move forward with that, um, but it's all based on zoning. And at the time we had State Street Ma Master Plan where we were gonna put how many 10,000 residential units on State Street. So you, we are creating the destination. We were focusing the growth here on a facility that has seven lanes versus scattering all throughout. Um, but with that being said, hey, this makes sense then to put these lanes on State Street 
okay, Orm's doing what they can, makes sense, let's do zoning, let's work towards that. Well, now that State Street Master Plan is essentially null and void, um, it's not to say that we can't have bus lanes on State Street, it just would change our phasing as to when something will happen in Orm. We could go from phase one of that project to phase three, or because we don't have that destination here, and all of a sudden this becomes political, maybe it goes down Geneva Road and it's a service vineyard and it's going to go, you know what I mean? Which that's, it's not likely, but it could be a reality. And the, the part for me that's frustrating is that I don't think everyone understands how UTA is funded. It's funded by a quarter cent sales tax and all, and all the communities that generate that tax they contribute that piece to the UTA pool and they take and do that with, with what they, I mean, they work with the communities, but essentially they have that mass transit component and they get that money and we're giving it to them and they're going to create the service rule. Well, Orem generates about $21 million of that sales tax of the 118 that they get on an annual basis. So if we're saying we don't want to have this here, we're essentially saying, wow, we're contributing 21 million, but we're not going to increase our service and these other communities will gladly take that. So I think it's one of those things that I think they need to understand the big picture and where things are. It's, as much as it might be frustrating that the UTA is here, they don't provide service, the buses are empty. The thing is, let's all at least get to the table and try and improve it and make it better. Instead of saying we don't want to do anything with you, that's fine, but you'd have to, it's kind of set the county where this sales tax is going and they're getting we're giving our portion to another community i guess is the way i want to put it if we're not going to be at the table well they're not even using it in utah county necessarily right so well it's the it's for utah the county, county it's yeah but they we do have the course in sales tax generating or that's here. what was beat right yeah you know, they wanted to use that elsewhere yeah who uh i think was that in the one of the uh, election issues last time last election where there's a i don't think they can because that quotient sales tax was a county yeah it's a county thing here we have to use it here so i don't and that's the thing. i don't remember what it was but yeah. never mind but 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 to your point is like i don't know if they understand the whole big picture of where things are i think they're frustrated they feel like UVX has a lot of empty buses they feel like the service around here isn't very good which it, it's probably missing <laughs> but i mean I don't know of a of a transit system that in this type of an environment that is going to function independently and have great service and not be subsidized. Well, I mean, that's the problem is I in Chicago, I've, I've never been a public transit guy, right? Um, just never used it. And I moved to Chicago and I was converted. But yes. their but their public transit is phenomenal. Yeah, I can get anywhere I want to get and I'm going to beat it. Than being in a car, yeah, by a long shot, right? And and that's not the case here. No, I really want to use it. I want to go to the airport yeah. using Front Runner, but when it takes me twice as long yeah. to get to Front Runner and get the airport, like, I, I just have fundamental issues with UTA. But I don't need to hijack this thing. Yet. But so I, I'm I, not sure buses down the middle. You know, I can say. Issue, right? but, I've started since January. I've been commuting to BYU. So I ride my bus. I ride my bike. I take the bus. And I can either take the bus line that goes up 1600 North and around to UVX, or I ride my bike down to State Street. Um, and State is a better option often because it runs more frequently. Right. So they've already started increasing the frequency of the buses on State Street. And once they did that, um, the ridership increased. So it doubled. The, the, it's not necessarily, yes, you need to get there faster, but you also need to get there. And Front Runner is its own beast. Um, but you need to be able to get there with great frequency. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, there, I just, I think keeping an open mind would be great about that. And I think that there are people at UTA who could give us some really great information. The, I know that the, I happen to go to a, a meeting that was a walk study as part of the environment review for a project that 
lots of these people were at, and I just kind of listened for a while. And the two people that worked on UBX from UDOT and UTA are still partnering together if there's going to be one on State Street. And they were a fantastic one, both very personable and knowledgeable, obviously. Was it Mary? It was Mary. Yeah. Who would, I would, I wanted to like be her BFF. <laughs> yeah. But she also had really great information, right? Because I've heard that too, UVX is always, is always empty. And I'm like, well, I know a lot of students who take it. So is it really always empty? And I've been taking it and then hearing their statistics, like prior to COVID, it rivaled the green line for tracks for ridership. They yeah. were having 12, yeah, it's around thousand 10, writers a day. It's around 10, 10,000 a day. Yeah, when I just think if, if you're taking that many cars off the road, yeah, that's awesome. Well, right? Yeah. I can I can take the bus and you can still drive. That's totally fine. But me not being in my car makes your drive look better. And I can I can talk to Mary and see if she'd be available to come to one of these commission meetings. You guys can I can tell her, hey, it's a Q and A. We're not gonna I'm not gonna have anyone hijack you or, or hold you hostage. But if you want to ask questions, because I thought the same thing. I used to I lived in Springville and I worked in Salt Lake and I could take the they used to have the express bus. I'd pick it up in, in East Bay Provo. It would go through Provo Orem and then it would get on the freeway. And then, like, the first stop in Salt Lake was where I worked at in Salt Lake, so it was great. Um, but it still took an hour and a half, and I could do it in 40 minutes if I drove, but I didn't want to put 100 miles on my vehicle a day, so I did it. Um, but I've often thought, as, you know, for me to go from Springville to here, it's 11 miles, I can ride my bike faster than I could get here on, on public transportation. On public. Yeah, it's like twice. It's probably like an hour and a half. Because you got to take here and then the frequency. And I've often thought, you know, there's enough people that commute. Could you collect the data to at least create commuter routes through all the communities to get people to get there? Because if it takes me 20 minutes, if it took me 40 to get here, I probably would take transit. It's an extra 20 minutes. It's not that big of a deal. And I'm saving the wear and tear on whatever. But, you know, we even had, there are five of us that lived in South County. We looked at doing van, van pool. But by the time we looked at it, it was the same cost for each one of us as it would be to drive our own car. The only thing we were saving were miles. It didn't make sense. So I would like to see mass transit improved. I just don't know what's the silver bullet to make it better. And they, I will say that they did um, at this meeting, it was clear because it was, it was about the intersection that's on the Pro, uh, Pleasant Grove Boulevard. It goes on to I-15. Mm -hmm. It's the last segment of their I-15 redo project. Um, and they showed a map of the proposed uh, BRT line on State Street. And there it doesn't go on State Street. It jutted down closer to yeah. the freeway because that's where the cities wanted it. And it makes sense if you drive on State Street right there, like there's not a ton of development right there. That's their big, and yeah, that's their big stuff. That's right where they're putting it. So they said, yeah, we're willing to move it. In Orem, I don't know that it necessarily makes sense to move off of State Street because you do want it on your commercial corridor. Like you, theoretically, right? The more opportunity that people have to walk by businesses, the better the businesses do. Yeah, and we, years ago when we did a Stormbreak project on State Street, back when UDOT would let us close a lane down in the middle of the day, so we went from three lanes to two, we were doing our Stormbreak project, and all the little businesses along in here saw an uptick in sales, because now they were going 35 miles an hour, and they saw, oh, there's a pizza joint, oh, I've always been looking for my little hobby thing, or whatever, and people would, now that they see it, they go in, so to your point, yeah, if you can create that traffic, but I mean, for us, we were trying to put that growth here, so it made the nodes, and we, and then it would incorporate mass transit. And hopefully, it would reduce trips and whatnot. Because State Street is a huge pass-through traffic. I think it's like twenty to thirty percent of the traffic on State Street is pass-through. Has nothing to do with any of us that live here. We're just watching people that live in Pleasant Grove go to Provo, and they just use State Street. So, so yeah, I would like. But they to see, they were super like. I'm sure they'd be willing to come and talk to us. Well, so yeah, I, I just, I, yeah. my only thought was bringing that up is, is if they start to do a new one, and maybe we don't have much to do with the zoning, but to the extent that we get a say in what UDOT decides to do or UTA 
maybe we talk to them. I'm willing to hear them out. I'm not sure I'll agree, but I'm willing to hear them out. But I'd like to see if, yeah. if we can have some input before they make decisions. Yeah. No, they have the study. They're just looking to clear environmental. It was like a billion dollar price tag or something like that. And they knew that that was coming. But I think the state's starting to realize too. I think you're going to see UDOT and UTA, either you'll see a merge or something happen, but UDOT's realizing they can't build themselves out of congestion. They got to start investing into other infrastructure. And if it means mass transit, if it means more frequency, if it means other things, I mean, I've, I talked to Eric, Eric Rasband, he's a planner down here with UDOT. Um, and we meet with UDOT, MAG, UVU, um, UTA on a monthly basis. And I've talked to Eric. It's like, you know, these guys will spend millions of dollars, billions of dollars on the freeway project. What if you guys just realize, hey, what if we took the money and we bought a commercial piece of property, say, in, in Spanish Fork? We built a five-story office tower. You understand everyone works in different spots, but you build at least at a cheap rate. Maybe there's 12 ORM employees that work here, and we go there, and we just work remotely. You guys provide a place. I'm not commuting, you're taking people off the road. I mean, you could invest into some things, create satellite opportunities to do things instead of just widening lanes so we all work in Salt Lake. That would make sense to me because Lord knows they spend a lot of money on roadways and property and everything else. And couldn't we just, you know, create these little pods? But anyways, I guess they'll stop about that. Yeah. What do you think, CJ? Oh, here's this in here. Taking it all in. There's a lot. Oh, it is. Well, you, yeah, and, I, and that's what I do. I'll sit and think about it a lot. Well, that's to frustrating because it takes so many years for things to happen. Oh, yeah, it takes a long time for people <laughs> to catch the vision. That's yeah. the thing is that usually it seems like the closer, I mean, you're around it enough, you start to catch the vision. But when I go home and talk to my wife about it, she thinks I'm crazy. She's like, what are you talking about? It's like, well, what if? I mean, it's not that far to think. But I like my car. I like being by myself. I don't want to ride a bus. I don't want to be on a train. I don't want to do that. That's where I say, great. I'll be on the bus. Yeah. You can be in your car. I'm just like, well, what if you thought about, you know, what if we were, we went in partners with our neighbors on an autonomous vehicle? And <laughs> just because there's, I mean, you got to talk about that too. I mean, you have autonomous vehicles. If all of us had one, we purchase a share of it, it takes us to work, and then during the day, instead of parking it, you put it into an Uber pool, it goes around and does its thing, it comes back, picks you up and takes you home, and maybe it's your turn this week, Jay, you have to charge it, and the next week it's Cheryl's, but I mean, there have been talks of that too. You go autonomous vehicles, freeway capacity doubles because now there's instantaneous braking, there's no, there's no reaction time, so now you don't have to follow as close which is great for I-15, for I but now how do I take that double capacity off on the center street? What does that look like and how does that all work? And so yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of things. You go to conferences and that's the thing, if you guys ever desire to go to UDOT's conference and listen to some of that, we can look at it. And it's part of the commission. I'd have no problem talking to and say, hey, I got transportation commission members. They want to go to your, you know, your, your autonomous vehicle or your drones or things like that, and they want to go in and see how, what is UDOT doing to prepare and how are they doing it. And Especially if they have it in Hawaii. Well, it's UDOT one is always <laughs> up in Sandy, so it's not that far. <laughs> but I mean, if you're interested in learning and seeing that, I have no problem doing it. I like going to those. And I think about the, the drone corridors and how they have the different levels, and they're already looking at these major corridors as being those. So you watch Star Wars and you see all those different tiers of whatever. It's eventually, not in my lifetime, but it will be there. Pretty heavy stuff, Cheryl. I know. So it's a lot to think about. <laughs> I did have one last thing before we adjourn. My sister-in-law, Shana, Sam just referred to her a few times. She's associated with the bike walk group. So they want to do a bicycle rides for people on this committee on to kind of show us what's good about biking in Orem and what's not so good. I'd love to. Does anybody else have any interest in doing this? They want to take us? Us. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We can pick the day, pick the five bikes if we don't have them. So 
So there is, we seem to figure out a time and a date. Fifth of Saturday, yeah. Probably the weekend, probably the best for everybody. Yeah. That'd be awesome. I'm a very hobbyist writer. Like I, I work on the periphery of people that are serious spandex writers. Mm -hmm. um, but I do like writing bikes with my kids. And there is somebody in that group. I don't know if it's Bike Walk Provo you're talking about or the Orm Bicycle Coalition. Um, but there's somebody in the Orm Bicycle Coalition that has um, biked every single road in Provo, including into every cul de sac and out. He like tracked it on Stravia. <laughs> Oh, you need to give that guy a different hobby. <laughs> you really like to ride his bike. He's retired. Uh, okay. He's retired. Okay. Yeah. That, that makes sense then. I believe. One of the greatest Strava But they, they, they have thing. really good and useful, I think, information. I think you're right. Sweet. So, I'm Rich Wynn. I'll send you better proposal to me. I'll tell him a Saturday if it works best for everybody. Right in the middle of the day, right? Perfect. In June. So that's not very good. Yeah, no. We'll see what they have this month or next month. Three hour weekends. Maybe earlier in the morning, so it's supposed to be cool. Yeah, that probably would be best. Next one. Yeah. Well, thanks for staying so late. Yeah, thanks to you guys. I mean, I mean, you should, yeah. I'm here, so it doesn't matter to me. Anything else? Motion to dismiss. Okay. <laughs> we have a motion to adjourn by Rust. Do we have a second? Is yes. Bernie still there? Did you second that? Yes. Jake. Still there, Bernie? Thanks. You already leave. I can't find my mouse. There it is. It's like a weird angle. Yeah. We have left. No, I'm glad you guys are here. There he is. Oh, there he is. He is there. Good. Bernie, are you asleep? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, now he's <laughs> not. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you guys are passionate about it, too, because it's, it's a good group to have. So, want a little bit of variety and diversity. So, I think we had a, we had a second. We did. Yeah. Okay. So, all we're good. Any, any opposed? Do you want to stay longer? All right. There we go. We can all help write my reports. <laughs> well, thanks, you guys. Thanks stay for, this late again next time. I have to get one of just some chocolates for you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. That if you guys have any questions, concerns, yeah, I'm, I'm very.